Hi, I'm DJ Ware. On this episode of the Cyber Gizmo, today we're going to tackle the topic of the process scheduler for Linux. This would be the new and improved one that has entered the Linux kernel as of 6.6. So we're going to talk about that a little bit today. Why the change? So we've been using one called the Completely Fair Scheduler, or CFS, since 2007. Quite a long time, 17 years. It's worked pretty well. It came about just in time because the Intel had just released their multi-core CPU, the Core 2 Dual, a year previously. Well, actually, it probably would have been in August of 20 of 2006. So yeah, probably maybe a matter of a few months and then CFS came and it started working just in time to be able to handle those multiple CPUs. CFS was designed, as the name suggests, to maintain fairness and balance. It allows the processes to receive a fair share of the CPU without being able to monopolize it. So, yeah, and occasionally tasks will fall out of balance, meaning that some of them didn't get their allocated amount of processor time or some of them went over their time. You can't always you can't always say, okay, process, get out, you're you're done. When they reach the end of their time quanta, that's the amount of time that's allocated per cycle uh, for each of the processes that enters the CPU. There's a clock that starts that says at the end of that clock cycle, it has to get off. But you can't always stop a process right at the minute that timer expires. They might be in the middle of a piece of critical code. So you have to wait until they idle out a bit before you can tell them, okay, bye, get off. And it can save it's in the state can be saved. So, yeah, so, so CFS, what's the problem with it then, if it was working so well? Well, to determine the balance, CFS has to maintain the amount of time that any of the tasks are actually taking. That's called the virtual runtime. The smaller that that runtime number is, that means that that process has not had its fair share of the CPU. So CFS attempts to order those, and it uses a, a tree structure called the red-black uh, balance tree in order to determine and calculate that process's position in the run queue. There isn't, in CFS, there isn't a formal run queue. It just pulls things off of that balance tree from the left and the lowest uh, nodes that are on the tree. It, it starts there because those are the smallest numbers in the virtual runtime. So, and, and the other thing is CFS also includes the concept of sleeper fairness so that tasks that are not currently runnable, for example, and they might be waiting for IO, they'll still be able to receive a comparable share of the processor when they eventually need it. Uh, and, and the other side of that is if the numbers were really low because of those I.O. weights, you don't want those tasks to monopolize the CPU either. So there has to be some mechanism to say, oh, well, I need to get you off even though you haven't still haven't reached your time and we'll come back and schedule you. It was a pretty good algorithm for its time, but there are some outliers that are just not being managed very well. In fact, when Alder Lake was first released, which had the first concept of uh, Intel's first concept of a P core and an E core, they were the, the the CFS scheduler was treating them all as the same type of CPU, thinking they were all equal in performance, and of course they're not. So that had to be then changed in the algorithm for CFS. They had to be modified so that it would pay attention to, is that a P-core or an E-core? The real problem came, though, when, when, these, when Intel released the Rocket Lake and the next generation, the 13th generation chips, because those have energy components that are part of the CPU as well to determine where to place loads. 
So, yeah, if you're trying to minimize your energy consumption, then you need to have another counter in here. Well, you can see this is quickly becoming a whole raft of bolt-ons for CFS. And the longer CFS runs to determine who's next, that introduces more lag or more latency into getting your process onto the CPU. So what happened? What, what needs to happen here? There was a paper that was written by Stoic, uh, Ion Stoic, back in 1995. That's a long time ago, uh, about a, a new type of scheduler called the Earliest Eligible Virtual Deadline First, or WEBDF. Uh, and that scheduler has been pretty well defined. It's pretty well known. People have have contributed comments and improvements to that design over the years. And so they they felt, Peter Zilstra, I hope I didn't butcher his name too badly, but he, he worked on that code and got it into shape to get it ready to deploy. Now, he wasn't thinking, oh, this will just go into the next kernel, but it did. Uh, what happened was Linus, when everything was said and done, they looked at it, people got a chance to play around with it, make their comments from the kernel team. There were no objections, and so it replaced the CFS uh, scheduler. I, I can't remember a time when the scheduler was replaced that quickly uh, because I was thinking, oh, this will probably take a few releases before everybody's happy. But in fact, uh, EVDF had been around for so long in the literature, everybody knew about it. Now... Typically, deadline schedulers are more associated with the real-time kernel for Linux because they operate on a different set of events that determine when to schedule and to take things on, put things on and take things off, whereas the mainline kernel is a time-sharing scheduler. However, EEBDF has that component in it, and a single defined scheduling policy that does not use heuristics. It doesn't require a bunch of complicated code. So there are a few variables to determine which processes and threads get to execute next. As far as the scheduling method of when it determines, once it has determined who gets the load, uh, WVDF and CFS are you're going to find are very similar in how they get the task running on the CPU. EEVDF uses deadline fair scheduling, while CFS uses start time fair scheduling. So which one of these two is actually better? Some say CFS is better. Some say WEVDF is better. In most cases, most say that it is essentially identical. The difference is in latency. That's where the difference lies. So is it a CFS killer? Uh, I don't know if I would, you know, I don't know if I'd go that far, but it it certainly does not seem to have the problems that CFS does. You'll find that CFS under heavy CPU use, usage may hang occasionally. So one of the things that is is causing problems, the Alder Lake, the Rocket Lake, the Meteor Lake processors, and those are are where you have cores that are defined to be performance, economy, and in the case of Meteor Lake, low uh, energy of, of economy cores. So those allow the process to consume a minimum of battery life while sustaining a small workload or maybe even supporting a low energy workload. So those type of processors are presenting new challenges for Linux kernels to be able to schedule the right workloads on the right processor type. Now, Intel has a solution for that for their processors called the Intel Thread Director, or you may also hear it called the Hybrid Cluster Scheduling. They still support the uh, hyper-threading on the P-cores. They do not support hyperthreading on the E cores. As you can see, I've got different classifications of processors. I have processors which are running uh, as fully functional CPUs and some of them that are operating as a hyperthread. 
So I've got to have some kind of way to identify what is the class of CPU that I've got here? Because you can't go on the numbering that Linux gives it because sometimes Linux gets mixed up and it'll 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 fold together E cores and P cores in the same list. So the one time you boot, you may find all the P cores in the first whatever six slots in my case, and then followed by eight E cores in the next slot. And then finally the hyper threads at the at the slots after that. And then the low energy at the very end. But but that still doesn't it still doesn't help you very much in identifying how do I know what processes to put on that particular core? So Intel came up with a with a, a classification and it's numbered from zero to three. If for now, I'm just going to go through an example. So if I have an SSE workload or a instruction set class that are using that, then I might assign a processor performance component of 1.27, which is a multiplier that goes against the clock frequency and a bunch of other things. The other one is AVX2, and I might assign that a little higher. It might be 1.5 because those are going to be used for decoding and encoding video, uh, for example, as well. Number two is an example where it's using the virtual neural network instruction. So in this case, it's an AI workload, and that might get a two. What if the core is completely empty and not doing anything? Well, it might just get a one uh, because it's paused and not doing anything at all. They then build out a, a table. So, and they identify these indexes along with the core, the CPU core that has that index assigned to it. Then they calculate an internal number based on the current, uh, the current clock frequency. And those numbers then get computed for each performance core, each economy core, all the way down the line. So and you could have, yeah. And so that determines which core is going to be cho chosen to run a particular task. What Intel did was, in the Meteor Lake, there is a hardware calculated processor class, and that number is dynamic. It changes, I don't know, every time the poll cycle runs through the cores. It'll determine which what, what number to assign it, and you don't have to do anything. There's nothing to calculate. Uh, there's no processor time that has to be given up. So it's all done for you, and it's all ready. In this case, though, like on the Meteor Lake, uh, and also on the uh, on the thirteenth uh, gen, you will find this kind of an architecture where you have the old hardware P state and the new Internet. Uh, in, excuse me, Intel Thread Director. The Intel Thread Directory goes through the Intel HFI. And HFI then talks to both the load balance, the idle load balance, and the periodic load balance. So it can adjust workloads while the the while the CPU is in a state where it's calling the periodic load balance to see if am I still in balance or not, or do, do, does there need to be something that needs to be adjusted? Idle load balance, of course, as we have said, is going to occur when the processor offloads the, the finished task and begins looking for new work. So let's look at a few use cases and, and walk through those to understand how this is going to work. So we have classifications assigned to the CPUs. We also have classifications assigned to the process. So in our first case, we have idle load balancing, which is in this case, we're simply looking for the highest performance core that is in alignment with the processes uh, uh, is identified in class based on its ISA it's using. It'll enter this state if it were pi partially idle. The number of P cores is less than the number of tasks, and that's less than the number of CPUs on the system. So in this case, the destination, the one that's going to receive the process, that will enter idle, uh, the idle load balancer, which will then search for a CPU that's busy 
but may not be running the right workload. So in other words, it's a, it's possibility is it's unbalanced. So it spots one that's two that's higher than the other one down at the end, which has a one. So it schedules it to be moved and it gets moved over to the P core. And that solves the balancing problem for that particular instance. But what happens if I'm partially idle and the number of P cores is equal to or less than the number of tasks and that is less than or equal to the number of CPUs? Well, in this case, the destination enters idle because it's got nothing to do, as you can see there. It'll search for a busy CPU to offload and it finds one. It finds one that has a class number of a one that's currently running in the hyperthread. Now, remember the order P cores, E cores, and then hyperthreaded cores are the preferred way of executing. And so it's going to say that one is on the wrong processor. It should be on an E core. And so it schedules that one to be moved to one of to the destination E core. And that then frees that resource up on the P core that's currently running the class two job. The other one is when it's called a live exchange, and this occurs when we have a partially idle system, but we might have parts of it that are fully utilized or maybe even overutilized as well. So in this case, the destination one enters the periodic load balancer. It's been running for a while. The periodic load balancer starts to look around and it finds a process that's running on an e-core with a higher processor class request. So it says, oh, I need to swap those two. And that's exactly what happens, is it will swap the class one onto the e-core and swap the class two onto the p-core. In this case, we got a problem because everything is a mess. We're fully utilized. All the processors are taken. All the hyper threads are taken. All the e cores are taken. And now we have stuff stacking up in the run queues. But not only are the job processes stacking up, waiting to run, we have higher classification processes that are waiting to get on. We don't want them to wait very long. And so in this case, when DST enters the periodic balancer, the periodic balancer will look at the queue and go, oh, I've got a high priority process here. So it's gonna idle the DST process that's currently there, and it's gonna bring two down and start it running. I, it By this time, it could do a number of things. If one of the other e-cores or one of the other hyper threads have become available, it may push that over on another process. Or it, because of the run queue state, it's going to say, well, I'm going to have to look at the values that are in the deadline to see what needs to be on the processor next and then schedule that to run one of those other ones that are sitting in the run queue. In this case, we have we have an overloaded machine, but it's pretty balanced. We have just a few things running. We have one process that's waiting in the run queue, but the others are are actively running on the destination one and two. But you'll notice that it's not quite right because the two classes on an E core and not on a on a on a P core. In this case, what is what should happen is that the it should have been a two that's on the destination one and a one that's on destination two. So in this case, what it's going to do is swap destination one with destination two uh, because that's a better balance than. Uh, having the two process running in a hyper thread and the one process occupying a E core. And there's one big difference right away. The performance choice on 6.7 went away for me and I had to actually go force it back into the system by installing a process, a uh, package that allows you to uh, add that performance element back in there. But I can tell you that it did warn me when I was doing that, when I was changing it, it said, this is not recommended. You, We recommend that you use balanced or power save and not performance.
like, well, that's counterintuitive. Wait a minute. We all this time, we've always looked at performance as being run hard, run fast, get off soon. But that's not the case here. In actuality, what I found out was, and by putting it into performance, oh, yeah, the, the fans spun up. Oh, yeah, the temperatures on the core start going up when they get busy. But the funny thing is, it's, it was making a lot of noise and drawing a lot of power, but it wasn't, it wasn't going anywhere. It was, like the, it was like a swimmer with their feet out of the water. It wasn't quite treading enough water to make a difference in the performance of the machine. In fact, in some cases, it actually ran worse than when the performance was in balance, when the governor was set to balance mode. And so they were right. Uh, that warning was right. You, you don't want to force balance on the system, especially when there are energy uh, parts in the equation because you're going to end up actually causing a regression to your performance. And what we have normally thought of all of for, for the last 30 years is performance is, is if I set something to draw more power, more frequency, I get better work. I get better. I get more work out of the CPU. And in this case, that ain't happening. So yeah, there are other problems that are coming in and biting you. Uh, and then I thought, well, okay, let's see if it's the other corollary that putting it in power save is going to make performance absolutely terrible uh, at the expense of, of keeping the battery alive. And I didn't experience that. I saw maybe a 4 to 5% drop, and in some applications, no drop at all. So that, I was like, wait, this is just totally non-intuitive. This is not way I've been thinking all these years. And so I'm telling you that you're you're going to you're going to have to uh, play around with more dials because it's going to vary by workload as to which one of those is going to have the benefit. Uh yeah, I mean in power save it is quite possible that yeah, you will suffer in performance because your workload is taxing the system in a way that it should actually be running faster for you and you can't get there. It, it comes down to the performance between the two. So I ran the Unix benchmark, which they say, don't do that. But I did it anyway, because I don't listen to anything anybody ever says. I just do, I just wanted to see what the test was like. I, I have to tell you that based on what I saw, now this, this is running performance mode on the 12, and it's running balance mode on the Meteor Lake. My brain would have told me that the Meteor Lake should have been less, should have been, and should have performed less. And it didn't. It performed better, as you can see. Uh, those are all of the different, and you can see that in some cases that, like at the uh, tail end of CFS and e e -E -F uh, DFF, or excuse me, double double E VDF. You can see that in when you compare machines against the CFS scheduler, you're not getting a huge bump, but you are getting a huge bump when you look at architectures, right? When you look at what architecture you're coming from, which you would expect, and so that's normal. What I was surprised at is that there was hardly any advantage on the 12th gen uh, processors at all to the new scheduler, but it works just as well. So the, with, but I wasn't running any outliers here. Now I did notice some weird behavior with CFS when it was doing things like pipe uh, throughput, the numbers were lower there on CFS than WVDF. So yeah, you may encounter that as well. I almost, I'm almost certain that there'll probably be additional patches to WEBDF because there's still a couple of open holes, uh, particularly with the memory, with, excuse me, with the energy management. I suspect that at some point Thread Director may, I, I don't know, I'm not Intel, I, I can't speak what their futures might look like. But the fact that they called out that the energy case was a fixed table seems to suggest that they might be working on something to make that more calculated by the hardware, similar to the CPU class. 
So the accommodation of policies, now it doesn't mean that EEDF is built to handle multiple policies, it, but it uses a policy model. So it is hypothetically possible, and this is conjecture, that it is hypothetically pro possible that in the future, there might be new policies developed that affect and impact uh, WEBDF to handle new things that are coming down the pike in the way the processors are designed. CFS has been with us a long time. It, it was a good run. It was a good scheduler. It's a good all-arounder. But at times, hardware, and because the hardware is changing, it, it's, it's having trouble. It's not doing very well. So farewell, old friend, and I'm looking forward to using more of uh, WEBDF. One thing's for certain, it won't hurt to put it on. It doesn't cause, it doesn't seem to be causing any regression that I have seen other than this use case where you pin your processor at 100%. And that's, that's never a good idea. Uh, you should, if you're, if you're running a, a CPU at 100% all the time, that's probably a time where you ought to be thinking about getting a new one. <laughs> so, yeah, that's probably a good a good time to sit down and see if you can afford to buy the next the next generation with more more uh, cores and and more processor speed than you currently have. But one thing's for certain, you have a path and a and a schedule that will, that will grow with you over the years. How long will double EBDF be viable? Who knows? Who knows? Maybe not 17 years, but uh, things are changing way too fast for that. There's already another scheduler, which is looking at the energy problem called Nest. Uh, and I might look at that. It's one of the schedulers that is not mainline yet. Uh, it may never be, uh, but it's, a, it's nice to see all these experimental things. That's the one nice thing about Linux that you can do is you can experiment with things that you can't do in other operating systems because they're so tightly controlled, you don't get a choice on what you do.